go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win.
Welcome to the report from Iron Mountain. This report is something you would never believe unless you read it. But you also have to understand the mindset of the government that requested it. And that is one of the most important features of this video. The objective was to determine accurately and realistically the nature of the problems that would confront the United States if and when a condition of permanent peace should arrive. This is one of the key elements of the report because we are to go under, under the Antichrist system, an era of supposed peace. And this is what this whole program was about. If and when a condition of permanent peace should arise, that means that peace in reality equals world socialism as we will find out as we journey through this report. And they were to draft a program for dealing with this contingency. In other words, this is a planned situation. The program equals the agenda, and how do we control the people of America if we move to an era of peace? And not only just America, but the, uh, the whole world at large. In 1961, Public Law 87297 was passed, paving the way for the United States to be merged with the United Nations. It's a very crucial law in that it disarms the American citizen in violation of the clear intent of the Constitution, which calls for our right to bear arms to maintain our free state. And by the calling for the disarming of all Americans, of course, we lose our free state and we are submerged actually into a slave state. Uh, the disarming was to be done by a period of gradual disarmament and as they were disarming the United Nations would be built up with a powerful standing army. The evidence suggests a CFR TC Bilderberg connection the rich men of the earth, the merchants of Babylon, the killers of the just according to the Holy Scriptures. The report concerns itself with a globalist agenda and the conclusions reached have been advanced by these groups. Every one of the conclusions in, uh, in the Iron Mountain report have been advanced by these groups, Committee of 300, the CFR, TC, Bilderbergers, Royal Institute for International Affairs, Tavistock, your Club of Rome, United Nations, it goes on and on. Okay, it began back in 1950 actually. These hearings uh, began to take place in the United States and the calls for a world government were actually held in 1950. Here's a resolution uh, in Congress that was considered and called for testimony and it says to provide a true world government through the adoption of a world government constitution. It was a clear intent to place uh, the United States directly under the United Nations and to scrap our Constitution. Universal peace is a prerequisite for the pursuit of that goal, and from the competitive anarchy of national, or nation states, therefore the age of nations must end, and the era of humanity must begin. You will find there's a constant call for the merging of all humanity. Here's a resolution uh, adopted in the United Nations. This is what it says, regulation, limitation, and balanced reduction of all armed forces and all armaments. The all armaments means your weapons that you have in your closet for your own defense. 
It includes handguns and rifles and all kinds of things. Here's your blueprint for world peace, which was issued also in 1961 uh, concurrently as this move uh, towards putting us under the United Nations. You'll find that as the United Nation or United States and the R Russian military are to be reduced, the UN is consistently brought up to a higher and higher position. The only thing we are left with are internal security forces. Under the Freedom From War, this is a packet issued by the uh, federal government to go along with uh, 87 to 97. This can only be achieved, the merging and disarmament, through the progressive strengthening of international institutions under the United Nations and by creating a United Nations Peace Force. See, they want to progressively strengthen the international institutions, all of which come under the United Nations. We are to lose our sovereignty. This can only be achieved through the progressive strengthening. By creating a United Nations peace, which really means police force, to enforce the peace. This is what Daniel said, and by peace the Antichrist shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. All right, back to the government report, the disbanding of all national armed forces and a prohibition of their reestablishment in any form whatsoever other than those required to preserve internal order and for contributions to a United Nations peace force. They are to bring the UN up to a point where no state should, would have the military power to challenge the progressively strengthened U.S. police uh, peace force, and all international disputes would be settled according to the agreed principles of international conduct. That's exactly what the Bible says. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. No one can make war with this final world entity. And if you will study your scriptures out, you will find that the United Nations fulfills every parameter listed for the uh, Antichrist system. And Public Law 87297 has been updated. There are numerous updates. You will, if you go search them out, uh, Public Law 101-216, for example, has been updated. Here's another one. I have today signed H.R. 1495, the Arms Control and Disarmament Amendment Acts of uh, 1989. Uh, it authorizes the uh, fiscal appropriations uh, to get this thing underway. Now, the problem with it is the Bill of Rights and Amendment 2, the right to bear arms, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. In other words, in reality, you cannot infringe that right in any way, method, or manner. The only way a people can remain free is to hold in their power the weapons necessary to secure their free state. This amendment deals with the international security of the United States from its own government. In other words, this amendment was to secure the people's freedom from their own government, from an internal government takeover. This right is not there uh, so that you can go hunting or for the other excuses made. It is there to prevent the government of the United States from becoming a dictatorship by treason. In other words, by betrayal of the Constitution of the United States. Now, in order to merge the United States into the United Nations requires a total betrayal of the Constitution, which guarantees you a free state through the right to bear arms. You see the connection? The United Nations is a communist, illuminist, Masonic world dictatorship, and there are no freedoms, hence they have to get the guns to eliminate the free state nation guarantee in our Constitution. 
The Iron Mountain Report, then, is a report in reality on how to circumvent the Constitution of the United States. And in reality, it's a document of treason, uh, of how the rich men of the earth are actually going to divert the attentions of the people away so that they can get this done. The guidelines given by the government for the Iron Mountain Report, one, military-style objectivity, two, avoidance of any value assumptions, and three, the inclusion of all relevant data. And this is a very important part of this report, is the avoidance of all value assumptions. This is what makes it so absolutely cold and inhuman. It is to be a moral, it is as a computer is a moral. It deals in factual data. There is not any mercy, there is not any compassion. It doesn't deal in right or wrong or what is good or evil. It is a report on the handling of men, women, children, and babies on the basis of herd or animal management without regard to any moral considerations whatsoever. It reduces people to objects. It reduces all humans to non-entities with no rights of self-determination, with no rights granted by the Creator, and with absolutely no rights under a Constitution. The Constitution has been effectively canceled by Iron Mountain. Now again, you'll find these resolutions coming up in Congress all the time that want to strengthen the United Nations uh, to establish an international criminal court SJ-32. Uh, These are bills uh, before the Congress and the Senate. Uh, the implementation of Agenda 21 and other Earth Summit agreements, which is all United Nations. Reagan called for the uh, uh, World Army. Uh, there is. Uh, Clinton has approved a UN Army. You're seeing it on TV all the time. War is required the glue of the nations, according to the Iron Mountain Report. Is war the scourge of the nations? It is said that war is merely an extension of diplomacy by other means. It is also said that war is necessary waste. But what is war? And why do peoples of the earth continuously fight and die? Why do millions of human families have a member or members that they have lost to this thing called war? What is the reality behind war? Does man have to fight wars, or can he develop a system of peace? And would the development of peace be worse than war itself? The Bible gives us some answers. The rest can be supplied by simple logic and deduction. James tells us that from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and ye cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because you ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. The root of war, then, is lust, and lust is want, and want is greed, and the root of greed is a self-centered heart, an unregenerated human heart. This is the key we need to explain war, and the Bible gives us many clues to why warfare is, and that in reality it can never be stopped. The root of the problem lies with the human heart, and the Bible says that the human heart is so desperately wicked that none can know it. Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Paul says in Romans, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the laws of God, neither indeed can be. Jesus was very emphatic that out of the heart of man poured forth all kinds of evil. The problem with mankind is then his evil heart, evil because it is self-centered and evil because it does not contain true love. The love within that it does have is hurtful or harmful, manipulative, self-centered, and filled with its own desires, according to the Lord. 
but we obtain other clues as well from the scriptures as to the true reasons for war, and particularly in our day and age. Jesus, uh, rather James says, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for the miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver is cankered. The rest of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped together treasure for the last days. Ye have killed and condemned the just. Now let's run a little logic. Lust is the center of war, lust is greed, and greed is from evil self-centered hearts. The Bible also says that the love of money is the root of all evil, or the height of all greeds. Lust then is greed, and the ultimate greed is an insane love of money, which brings with it power, which brings with it control over mankind. Thus the rich men of the earth are indeed in total control over money, and they have developed a system of economic controls well laid out in the scriptures. If the rich men of the earth gain control over the planet via their Babylonian economic system, then they are the ones who are only powerful enough and rich enough to wage war, and they are the only ones who can develop the war machines that you are looking at on your television screen. They are the ones who can develop the weapons necessary for modern warfare. Iron Mountain agrees. The very title confirms the Bible. The title says that it is a report on the desirability and feasibility for peace. It was ordered by the rich men of the earth. Therefore, they themselves must be the ones waging the wars, and now they have elected not to wage wars, but have elected uh, to do something else because warfare is drawing to a close, it will have soon served its purpose. In other words, it is a deliberate effort to bring in another system, for the first system of war has almost accomplished the goals originally intended. Albert Pike was purported to have written a letter in which he outlines three world wars. Each had a specific purpose and each had a goal. The last war, World War III, was to be fought to bring in an era of peace under Lucifer. It was to be fought predominantly uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union, and it would come in an era of seeming peace when it seemed like everything was fine, everything was great. The Bible says that the Antichrist is a man of peace. He rides a white horse and has no war machine. There are no arrows in his bow. He is to usher in a period of peace after great wars. Iron Mountain is about this era of peace. Iron Mountain is a report to aid Antichrist in his rise to power. It is in reality a report from hell. Iron Mountain asks, what can be expected if peace comes? What should we be prepared to do about it? What, for instance, are the real functions of war in modern societies? Th these are very important questions. The Soviet Union says the peaceful exploration of outer space is the constructive alternative to the plans uh, aimed at spreading the arms race. In other words, we are always going to find that the opposite of war is peace, which of course it is in reality, but what Iron Mountain is getting at is what are the real functions of warfare, the invisible functions of warfare? What role do they play in the overall structure of human society? For example, the Soviet Union has been on a war fitting for years and years. We have, to a lesser extent, in America been on a war footing. Uh, it's been predominantly uh, a Cold War for, for many, many years, but nonetheless it has been, and uh, as far as the economics of it are concerned, it has been a war era. It's been an age of war. And what this report is asking about is what about peace? It is surely no exaggeration to say that conditions of world peace would lead to changes in the social structure of the nations. These changes would be of unparalleled and revolutionary magnitude. 
as we would transition then from an era of war into peace, what would be the problems? It is an incorrect assumption that war as an institution is subordinate to the social system it is believed to serve. What they're saying here is that nations wage war for reasons other than what they state. War itself is the basic social system within which others are secondary modes of organization, conflict, or conspire. In other words, war itself is the basic social system of mankind. And if we go to peace, we're going to have problems unless we understand that. It is the system which has governed most human societies on record today. Well, this is, of course, very true in our day and age. We have seen nothing but war, starting uh, predominantly with World War I and coming forward. Uh, the Soviet Union has uh, had tremendous expenditures in their military, and the United States has likewise. It's been, in reality, an arms race. Uh, we're going to find out there is a reason for it. The capacity of a nation to make war is the greatest social power it can exercise. War making, active or contemplated, is a matter of life and death, says Iron Mountain. The misconceptions of war, one, to defend a military, or in, uh, defend a nation rather, from military attack by another, or to deter such attack to defend the national interest, economic, political, or ideological. To maintain or increase a nation's military power for its own sake. Now you see, these are the visible or more obvious reasons why a person would say, well, that's why we have war. But what they're saying is there are more, less obvious, very invisible reasons for why nations have war. And this is the heart of the entire Iron Mountain report. Its conclusion was that war is absolutely necessary. It's an absolute requirement for human societies and nations to come together it is in reality, they claim, the glue of the nations. The Soviet military machine, or its war-making capacity, is the actual glue that has held the Soviet Union and the Communist Empire together. If they were to move into an era of peace, what would happen? All right, Iron Mountain says it is these invisible or implied functions that are the dominant forces in our society. So what we have to find out then is what are the true functions of war in a society. Why, for example, has the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, both of which are controlled by the rich men of the earth, been on a constant war footing, constantly escalating this conflict? Why are they doing it and what are the reasons behind it? Economic reasons are it is a necessary waste that operates outside the normal economic supply and demand system. Warfare creates an artificial demand. In other words, the war system itself, having huge militaries with all of their armaments, with all of the research and developments, creates a demand. This waste of money outside the system, according to Iron Mountain, acts as a counterbalance to the economic uh, growth of the nation. It is progressive for research and development of weapon systems, and it spurs technological advances which spin off and help society at large. Defense spending, per se, might be countenanced on economic grounds alone as a stimulator of the national metabolism. In other words, war itself, for economic purposes, is a tremendous growth factor. For the political reasons, it's different. A nation is a group of people organized together with a common goal and a national identity. The nation has an outlook or an attitude of how it will deal with other nations, and that's what we call foreign policy. A nation's foreign policy, says Iron Mountain, can have no substitute 
if it lacks, or no substance rather, if it lacks the means of enforcing its attitude. In other words, if the nation is not strong enough, it doesn't matter what their attitude towards somebody else is. War is itself the defining element of any nation's existence vis-a-vis -vis any other nation. War then equals nations because it is the glue of nations and what causes them to come together and peace would mean the dissolving of the nations. The elimination of war implies the elimination of national sovereignty and the traditional nation state. Please understand the importance of that remark in Iron Mountain. It is the elimination of war that brings us to world government. The war system not only has been essential to the existence of nations as independent political entities, but has been equally indispensable to their stable internal development. Without it, the war system, no government has ever been able to obtain its legitimacy, or in other words, we could say its right to rule its society. War is the basis of that claim to rule, and it is therefore the glue that holds a nation together, according to Iron Mountain. The possibility of war provides a sense of external necessity without which no government can remain in power. The organization of a society for the possibility of war is its principal political stabilizer. All right, in other words, for the Soviet Union, they said that the American people were the enemy. And that gave them the glue which held the Soviet Empire together, which rallied the people to make such sacrifices so that we could build up this huge war machine. The basic authority of the modern state over its people resides in its war powers. Now that's another very important statement. Therefore, a substitute for the war system must be found in order to control the people and provide stability and legitimacy of government if we go into an era of peace. Now we know that the United Nations is to be that era of peace. So therefore, what they are saying is we have to find substitutes for what war does, the invisible functions of war. We have to find a substitute for that if we are going to go to peace. Obviously, if the war machine is discarded, new political machinery would be needed at once. In other words, as they phase war out, they have to phase whatever they're going to put in its place in to control the people, to control the nation. This is an essential part of Iron Mountain. Until it, the substitute for war, is developed, the continuance of the war system must be assured to maintain the stability of its internal organization of power. In other words, we have to keep the war system going in order to remain in control. Keep war until all substitutes are in place and running so we don't lose our rulership. In other words, those that are in power are going to remain in power. They've got to figure out a way to do that. So they're going to de-escalate the war system as they bring in a peace system. And the peace system is going to radically alter our societies. What substitutes for war are there? Well, it has to be a universal threat of equal magnitude as that of World War. The immediate loss of life and the immediate thought that blood is going to be shed. It has to be credible and it must be accepted by the vast majority of the population of any given nation or in reality the whole world if they're going to bring in global peace. Credibility in fact, says Iron Mountain, lies at the heart of the problem of developing a political substitute for war. 
We must emphasize that one must be found of credible quality and magnitude if a transition to peace is to ever come about without social disintegration. In other words, really what they're saying is a nation would self-destruct without an external threat of some type. It is more probable in our judgment that such a threat will have to be invented rather than developed from some unknown conditions. That means exactly what it says. They're going to invent a system to accomplish this. An effective political substitute for war would require alternate enemies. In other words, we have to find an external threat that's uh, essentially very large. It may be, for instance, that gross pollution of the environment can eventually replace the possibility of mass destruction by nuclear weapons as the principal threat to the survival of the species. In other words, they're going to bring the environment up to a point of global threat. Poisoning of the air and of the principal sources of food and water supply is already well advanced and at first glance would seem promising in this respect. It constitutes a threat that can be dealt with only through social organization and political power. But from present indications, it will be a generation to a generation and a half before environmental pollution will be sufficiently menacing on a global scale to offer a solution as a substitute for war. In other words, we replace the war threat with an environmental threat. Now you know why the environment is on the TVs and the media constantly. A generation to, is about 30 years, so it would be about 1991 that this would be brought up to a global scale. It is true that the rate of pollution could be increased selectively for this purpose. In other words, what they're going you could you could selectively find areas where you could deliberately increase the pollution to get this threat in motion a little quicker. 
It is true that the rate of pollution could be increased selectively. In fact, the mere modification of existing programs for the deterrence of pollution could speed up the process enough to make the threat credible much sooner. In other words, let's have the governments drag their feet on pollution controls or the enforcement of pollution controls. And around the world, that's exactly what we have seen, a matter of foot dragging on the areas. One would then perhaps get the concept that this was all deliberate. Allow pollution to deliberately get worse until it can be manipulated by the controlled media into a world crisis. A global crisis has to be developed. Al Gore, Vice President, very timely book. Perhaps coincidentally, he wrote the book called Earth in the Balance, Ecology and the Human Spirit. It's a modern version of Iron Mountain in the ecological field. And, and in reality, it's quite an interesting book. You, you should go out and buy a copy of it. Uh, the world uh, government organizations are pushing this climate crisis, emergency Earth Rescue Administration, the people of the earth have a new common en enemy which requires an emergency worldwide campaign. You see, and we have to abandon our armaments to join in a common cause for survival. What did Iron Mountain say? It had to be a threat to the survival of the species. first able to see complete pictures of the Earth. Environmentalists began to look at our planet as a single fragile ecosystem. Now we are intensely studying the thin halo of atmosphere that surrounds and protects Earth. It recycles the air we breathe, regulates climate, and acts as a protective barrier filtering out much of the sun's harmful radiation. Last year, an international group of scientists proved that ozone, the key element in this filtering process, is being lost at an alarming rate over the South Pole. In fact, a sizable hole develops over this area each winter. Without ozone, the sun's harmful radiation will destroy life on Earth. A group of man-made compounds called chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, used as refrigerants, cleaning solvents, and in some plastic foams, are to blame for this environmental problem. They eventually make their way into the atmosphere and destroy ozone. According to Dr. Brian Toon of NASA's Ames Research Center, it is a global-scale environmental problem. This really marks the first time uh, in the history of environmental science where human beings on one side of the planet have done something to the planet that has significantly affected it globally and on, on the far side of the planet from where the original pollution took place. Using the beautiful seaport town of Stavanger, Norway as a base of operations, an international team of scientists assembled this year in an emergency effort to make a detailed study of the North Pole. Most of the work was performed aboard two NASA aircraft. This is the ER-2. For the mission, special wing pods are attached containing atmospheric chemistry analysis equipment and a host of other instruments. Typically, flights are made about 12 miles up, along the fringes of space, right into the layers of atmosphere directly affected by ozone loss. The ER-2's research partner is a modified DC-8. It flies at lower altitudes, but has increased fuel reserves, which allow it to cover more territory, even flights directly over the North Pole. Inside, the DC-8 is actually a complete scientific observatory, loaded with sensing instruments. 
scientists perform their experiments and are able to map results right on the spot. This instrument contains four lasers capable of shooting light many miles up into the atmosphere. The light reflects back to the plane and provides scientists with a cross-sectional map of ozone concentrations as well as aerosols, or regions where ozone depletion is capable of occurring. Initial results from both aircraft indicate that high concentrations of CFCs have been found at northern latitudes, primed for ozone destruction. When combined with high altitude ice clouds, the right amount of sunlight and confined slow moving masses of air, ozone destruction occurs. As a result of this airborne mission, scientists were able to confirm the process and predict areas of depletion. International policymakers have met in hopes of limiting the amount of CFC production and recently agreed to phase out its use by the year 2000. Many scientists worry that this may not be soon enough. Again, Dr. Toon. With the ozone problem, for example, when you release chlorofluorocarbons to the environment, it's decades to centuries before those are removed. Researching safe economic replacements for CFCs is a vital part of solving this serious environmental issue. Thanks to the intensive work done in the last few years, we know why ozone depletion exists. It is now up to the world community to take responsibility for the future of our global environment. Two Landsat satellites continue to orbit the Earth 14 times a day. From their 570-mile-high vantage point, they return images like these taken over rich California farmlands. Telltale red images indicate vigorous vegetation growth. The state of California is using Landsat imagery to inventory and map its irrigated cropland. Ecology, the balance of nature, is important to all life. One of the tools we can use to monitor this balance of nature on Earth is the satellite. Satellites can be used to observe our planet from a high vantage point. A NASA film called Remote Possibilities tells the story. From far out in space, the Earth appears serene and beautiful, displaying no hint of our crowded planet's many problems. changed our planet, we have become aware that in many ways we are exhausting it. Exhausting our food supplies, our sources of energy, our natural lands, exhausting the potential of even the once seemingly limitless oceans. Management of Earth resources is at a critical stage. It has never been more important that we understand the environmental relationships of our planet. Scientists are striving to apply the technology of the space age, the quest for more and better information about these complex relationships. In 1972, a new kind of satellite left the launch pad and rose to an altitude of 910 kilometers from Earth. There it settled in a circular orbit around the planet. This satellite, called Landsat, opened a new era of Earth resource management. One substitute for war has then been found. The Iron Mountain agenda is being carried out. The objectives of the EcoScan? Well, the UN will end up with control over all the land, and ownership of the land will be held by the rich men. There is arising a crisis of worldwide proportions involving developed and developing countries alike, the crisis of the human environment. The process of compromise of national interests will, of course, have to take place. International economic security is inconceivable unless related not only to the world's environment, but also to the elimination of the threat to the world's environment. 
Well, the only major threat is private property ownership and private property rights where people can do as they want. Let us also think about setting up within the framework of the United Nations a Center for Emergency Environmental Assistance. You can see how they're raising this thing up to an emergency status, an emergency le level. And that's what Mikhail Gorbachev said in December 8, 1989 in a speech to the United Nations. The United Nations will be the controller of all the lands in the world through their various ecological, environmental uh, organizations that they are in the process of setting up. In fact, the Rio Earth Summit was for that specific reason. Now it's owned by the rich men. That's who owns the United Nations. That's who actually runs it. Eco Foundations of the World Wildlife Fund, Heritage Trust, Nature Conservancy, etc. Uh, there's a lot of them and you have many UN organizations. And the rich men of the earth sit on the boards of directors on all of these groups. These groups are buying up huge chunks of private land for conservation, they say, and to preserve the earth. And of course, all of it is to be owned by the rich men. And what they cannot purchase by normal means will be taken under zoning controls, DNR regulations, or other land grab means via governmental authority and regulation. All land will be under strict eco-controls because after all, we are now involved in, in the middle of an eco-emergency and it's nothing but a scam. It's really a debt for land swamp is another part of it. The international bankers loan and control the monies to all the countries and through interest have driven them into huge debt status. The debt of the United States is in the trillions. The bankers then come forward with a new plan. They will take the nation's land and then they will cancel the debt of that nation. It is called a debt for land swap. This land will be held by a world conservation bank owned of course by the rich men of the earth. They will then own all the land, all the resources, all the food. They become the absolute masters and all the people become the slaves. It's a perfect scam. It's a perfect system. Because the eco threat is now global, then obviously it can only be controlled by a global authority. And guess who that is? Why, of course, it's the United Nations. Now, the eco scam is being pushed by every organization that's involved in the environment. Uh, even Time magazine ran an article on the endangered earth. It's being put in all your children's uh, school books, all of their study books, about the crowding of human life, about how we have such an ecological crisis, an environmental crisis, and unless we all do our share, why the whole world is just going to disintegrate and the entire population of man will be eliminated. That's according to them. It's very interesting that Daniel said of the Antichrist that he shall divide the land for gain. In other words, he takes over all the land and divides it up amongst these various foundation groups. And that's exactly what's happening.
It has been hotly argued that such a menace would offer the last best hope for peace by uniting mankind against the danger of destruction by creatures from other planets or from outer space. Experiments have been proposed to test the credibility of an out-of-the-world invasion threat. It is possible that a few of the more difficult to explain flying saucer incidents are of this nature. The thrust of the second threat is to unite mankind against a common enemy. The escalation of the UFO mystery requires careful media control. The threat must also dovetail into the agenda for a one world government. Everything that Iron Mountain proposes in all of their substitutes will lead into a one world government. And that is the whole nature of it. There has been a tremendous amount of interest in UFO activity. Many, many books have been written about it. Uh, the average Christian, I believe, probably poo-poos the whole subject, but we believe here at uh, CIA they're making a tragic mistake when they do that uh, because the Bible uh, does mention some things that would tend to imply very strongly that UFOs are in fact real and will be a latter day occurrence uh, just before the end and just before the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, as you can see here's a book uh, for Christians UFO in time delusion. It is part of the grand delusion that God is going to cast down upon man for the rejection of Jesus Christ in the end. There have been many books written about uh, the government's cover-up of the UFO experience and that the United States government knows exactly what is going on and we would agree with that uh, from the viewpoint of the scriptures uh, that the people of the world, uh, the governments of the world, uh, the highest levels of uh, the powers that be uh, know exactly what's going on when it comes to the UFO mystery. They do because their mind is controlled by Satan and he is the author of all of this. It's part of the grand delusion in the end. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now Satan was cast down to earth, and we were to observe it from here. It would appear as though he came down from heaven. For as the days of Noah were, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. Now Jesus said, so shall it also be. And the days of Noah were quite a few. He lived 950 years before and after the flood. He uh, was there when uh, men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. And the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. Now, the book of Enoch gives us some information about that. It happened after the sons of men had multiplied in those days that the daughters were born to them, elegant and beautiful. And when the angels, the sons of heaven, came down, you see, they took wives, each choosing for himself, whom they began to approach and with whom they cohabitated, and uh, teaching them sorcery and incantations. Uh, and uh, the whole situation is one where these were literal fallen angels that came down and mated with the daughters of men and they produced uh, a race of giants according to the book of Enoch and many ancient writings give this interpretation to the sons of God mystery of Genesis 6. And what is interesting is, is that they said they would return. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of demons. Now, the word seducing comes from the word planos, which, if you do a word study, comes all the way back to where we get our word planet. 
Could it be that the interpretation is, in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to impostors from other planets? That would be the most literal translation, and that is also exactly what is happening. These impostors are actually demons pretending to be from outer space. It is part of the grand delusion. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They reject the concept of creation, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. This would result in UFO contacts of the first, second, and third kind as Satan sends his advance guard to prepare man for the grand delusion. On the surface of an average planet, circling an ordinary yellow star, an advanced intelligence searches the skies for evidence of life. Directed by even higher intelligence, machines with brains of silicon patiently sift through faint shards of radio data for the unmistakable signal that will indicate the first sign of life beyond Earth. Now plans for the most sophisticated SETI search ever focus on the Goldstone Deep Space Communication Complex in California's Mojave Desert. It is the site of tests for a possible future NASA project one not yet funded. The full-scale NASA system, when operational in the next decade, would be billions of times more powerful than the sum of all previous searches. For Carl Sagan, a proponent of SETI for many years, this technical progress has made the present unique. For the first time, we're mustering substantial, sophisticated, serious uh, scientific searches for uh, for extraterrestrial intelligence. There's never been a time like that before. So there is some chance that in the next few decades we will get a signal from some spectacularly distant, spectacularly exotic civilization and everything on Earth will, as a consequence, change. That is possible. search for life beyond Earth has been debated for centuries. Deciding what sort of signal to look for in the skies is no easy task. NASA's proposed search focuses on radio, a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum where nature produces the least interference for any intelligent signal. The plan is to use existing radio antennas and combine them with advanced computer hardware and software specifically designed for the task. Signal processing equipment suitable for SETI is constantly becoming more powerful and more efficient, but also cheaper and smaller than ever before. The pioneer Frank Drake came up with a way to organize our developing knowledge and current ignorance. SETI scientists often use what's called the Drake Equation to illuminate the necessary conditions for contact and to provide a rough estimate of the number of other civilizations. The existence of other technical civilizations depends upon astronomy, how planets form, comparative planetology, biochemistry, the role of intelligence in evolution, technology, and the fate of technical civilizations. So SETI becomes a way to test our theories of the origin and evolution of the universe and the place of life within it. There are several keys here that we want to look at as we keep Iron Mountain's report in mind. The two primary keys are that evolution is an accepted fact 
and ETs are now accepted at the highest levels of government. We believe that the SETI program is camouflage for what is really going on or the contact uh, reports uh, that have been gotten out from the government under the uh, Freedom of Information Act are in fact uh, cover uh, for the SETI program. But the two we believe are going to merge in the end and introduce uh, mankind to the aliens who are in reality demons uh, and Satan's advanced guard. The movies that have produced are very important. Uh, Satan plants a seed, he waters it, then he sits back and watches it grow, and then he reaps the harvest. And the harvest, of course, is the loss of millions upon millions of men. The Day the Earth Stood Still was produced many years ago, but it's a very, very important film in that it planted the seed. The Day the Earth Stood Still uh, said that war must stop, Peace must be enforced, and world government is a requirement to uh, get all of this to happen. The message was very important. E.T., a very, very popular movie, uh, taught us some things as well. It said that reptiles are very cute, that love is the answer, that love heals, but more importantly, that we all in evolve in a different manner. You're going to find evolution at the bottom of all of these movies. And Star Wars is another one. Uh, how famous they were. Well, they're programming the human mind for certain things. One, evolution of the races, good and evil forces, a universal, eternal fight between the forces of good and evil, and more importantly, a federation of planets a uniting of the nations, a uniting of all the planets, mankind will evolve upwards and eventually will join an intergalactic civilization. And this is the important keynotes in every one of these movies. Uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind was a very, very important film. It, was, it bases itself on evolution, two, that the United Nations is a central player in that movie, the U.S. military is connected to the United Nations in that movie and that mankind will join interplanetary civilization. It starts by contact, by uh, exchanges of the races. In other words, some of our people go there and some of their people come here. Now, something surfaced uh, not too long ago called Majestic 12 that dealt with government contact with aliens. A lot of people laugh at this document and think it's a hoax. Our research against the Bible would say that it is not a hoax, that this actually is legitimate and that contact has been made. Operation Majestic 12 is a top secret research and development intelligence operation established by special classified executive order of President Truman. Now, this took place uh, back some years ago. Very interesting, however, what Majestic 12 sets up. A rancher reported that one, a UFO, had crashed in a remote region of New Mexico. Now, you might have even seen this uh, replayed on uh, Unsolved Mysteries. They ran uh, a series on this. A secret operation was begun to assure recovery of the wreckage of this object. Aerial reconnaissance discovered that four, uh, four small human-like beings had ejected from the craft. All four were dead. News reporters were given the effective story that the object had been a weather balloon. They are discounting the UFOs to the public while they gather the evidence uh, secretly. The biological and evolutionary, there's your key, processes responsible for their development has apparently been quite different from those in Hobo sapiens. Evolution is then a proven fact insofar as the government is concerned. They have accepted evolution as an established fact. The aliens then did not evolve as we did. This is the very basis of the grand delusion. It's creation versus evolution. Evolution is essential for the grand delusion because men reject the creation 
of the world and people by Jesus Christ. So it's very important you understand that evolution is the keynote. The ultimate intentions of these visitors is completely unknown, the report said. But if you read the Bible, you will know they are demons and you will know they are the advanced guard of Satan and that they are setting up the world for its final uh, ruin and taking of people into eternal hell. Uh, UFOs are real. There's no question about that they are real. The only question is, is what are they? And if you take the evidence of the scriptures, uh, definitely we believe here at least that they are the sons of God returning just exactly as they said they would in a, all the occultic literature talks about this. Now there is an area out west called Area 51, uh, Groom Lake. Uh, there's also Tonopah. Uh, there are several areas uh, from which Project Red Light was developed. It's a top secret testing program for alien technology for defense purposes. This is very interesting that a lot of this stuff is uh, being leaked right at this moment uh, as we get into this. A congressman said, I have no comment as to what is going on in Area 51. That was Congressman Harry Reid and he went out there to visit the area because the Air Force had made a land grab and he went out there on behalf of his constituents to find out why. It is said that President Eisenhower signed a treaty with actual aliens in 1957. The swap was they could take our people for experimentation and we would get technology in exchange. In other words, the aliens come to Earth, we take their technology to build our defense mechanisms. Now a lot of people think this is ridiculous, but if you read what it says about Babylon the Great, the nation, it gets all of its technology from Satan. Satan is the one that gives them the power. And this is why the United Nations is being brought up. And this is why the United States is so deeply involved. In, in exchange for technology, the U.S. government agreed to allow the aliens to abduct humans for experiments. And this accounts for the large number of abductions reported all over America. This is part of the grand delusion which has evolution at the root of it. Now you have actually two options. All of the leaks of this type of information are disinformation or it is real and the aliens really are here. The Bible evidence would be that it is real the aliens are here and that they are the advanced guard for Satan. He's programming the human race for this delusion and it's based upon evolution. The sons of God of Genesis 6 have returned as they said they would in occult writings and Jesus said as it was in the days of Noah so would it be again. And that's when the sons of God came down. So therefore the agenda of Iron Mountain for external threat number two has been and is being carried out. Well, scientists are even going to the UN now to find out how are we going to answer these uh, aliens from our SETI contacts at NASA. They believe the UN should do all of this. And so you see it elevates the United Nations to power. And this is very important. It's part of the Iron Mountain uh, uh, agenda. It might be argued that a well armed international police force operating under the authority of such a supernatural court could well serve this purpose. In other words, they're going to set up a, another threat. This is threat number three actually, an omnipresent, virtually omnipotent political po or police force. It's, uh, it's an international police force because remember if we go into peace we have to dissolve the nations because war is the reason we have nations alright so the report then that was issued by the State Department freedom from war and the program was to establish a permanent international peace force within the United Nations in other words to, 
deliberately bring it up. The peacekeeping capabilities of the United Nations would be sufficiently strong and the obligations of all states under such an uh, arrangement sufficiently far-reaching as to assure peace and a just settlement of, difficult, of differences in a disarmed world. Uh, they're going to use the United Nations to keep the peace. In other words, a world government, which is exactly what Daniel talked about and Jesus talked about. And uh, it is very deadly. During stage two, states will develop further the peacekeeping processes of the United Nations to the end that the United Nations can effectively uh, suppress any threat or use of force by anyone. And that would include the uh, America, the American people. It's going to be omnipresent and it's going to be omnipotent in its ability to handle and this is what Revelation says who can make war with the beast remember that the US and the Russia are to have their internal uh, or militaries turned over to the United Nations in this three-stage process and we end up with the UN in total control of the world a global entity precisely as Daniel and Revelation talk about it's, uh, and Jeremiah and Isaiah refer to it as, of course, Babylon. And this process, of course, emerges bringing out the United Nations as the final end-time global ruling entity, which the Bible refers to as the apparatus of the Antichrist, or we could say the Antichrist system. And that is why it sits in New York City, the big city. On the wall in the Security Council is a phoenix. That picture you're looking at right there is in reality the phoenix bird, uh, which is to grow up out of the old world order. America is to be patrolled by Russian, Belgian, Irish, and Colombian and Venezuelan troops under this plan. Uh, UN troops are already on U.S. soil, and it won't be very long before these sites that you're seeing right here are going to be very commonplace in the United States. And if the American citizens resist, they are simply going to be liquidated according to the Bible. Uh, this power will come to pass. They've laid their plans well, and God has ordained it uh, uh, and, allowed it, and is allowing it to happen. And so it's in reality here in America, it's a judgment against the United States. Uh, there are many books written about a United Nations Peace Force, so this is not anything we're making up. Uh, they come in under the, the UN Charter. And the last part of it, this principle of non-interfering in a nation shall not prejudice the application of enforcement measures under Chapter 7. In other words, the United Nations claims that it doesn't really want to get involved in, in internal national affairs, but the opposite is in, react, uh, in reality the truth. Chapter 7 deals with action with respect to threats of the peace, breaches of the peace, or acts of aggression. And it's the Security Council itself that determines the existence of a threat, breach, or act of aggression. And it can even walk in under the threat, or it's a possibility that we might have problems. And they determine the existence of any threat to the peace. So they can come in if they choose to on very fragile grounds, which is exactly what they did in Somalia. Should the Security Council consider that measures provided in 41, which are more economic uh, I don't know exactly what word to use, but sanctions, I guess, is the best word to cover it. If that doesn't work, if economic sanctions do not work, then they can resort to military powers. And they can use whatever they have to to maintain or restore international peace. Now, Psalm 2 says that the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Where do the rulers of the world meet? They meet at the United Nations. And this is where they take their counsel together. And the United Nations is, according to the Bible, anti-Christ, anti-God to its very core. It is, in fact, the substitute 
for God and Christ on planet earth. They intend to take it for themselves. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and shall break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings. Now, it's a diverse kingdom. The United Nations is not a kingdom, <clears throat> and it's not a nation. It exists solely by treaty power, by an arrangement of nations itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. The United Nations is to be brought up to full global power with an army so powerful that none can fight against it. That's the entire plan, and that is exactly what the Bible talks about for the end times. It will also break into pieces the entire world, and that's done under Article 52, which deals with regionalism, which is, in fact, breaking the world into pieces. <clears throat> and this is how they do it. They actually subdivide the world into ten regions. That came out of the Club of Rome, and here are the regions on, on the uh, TV screen. Uh, region 1, of course, is uh, North America, and it's Region 1 by virtue of the fact that it, North America, and particularly the United States, are the is the primary power behind the United Nations enabling this to happen. The United States itself is broken down into 10 federal regions. We have global regions, and now we have national regions. And in our country, they are simply called uh, federal regions. And we're moving, in, a, in effect, from elected officials to an appointed officials to non-elected bureaucrats who are appointed. Now, each region has uh, different states in it, and the number of states varies with each particular region. Then each state is subdivided up into its particular regions. Many times it falls along county lines, many times it doesn't. Overlapping all of it is, of course, a uh, grid that keep getting smaller and smaller, which is the reason why thousands or millions, actually, of Americans are getting address changes. They're going under the United Nations grid system, which divides the world into tiny pieces, which is exactly what Daniel said. They can get it right down to your house number. In fact, they can get it down to about 10 square yards of turf. By Recently, NASA's Landsat 4 satellite, shown here just before its trip into space, was launched from the Western Test Range by a Delta rocket. This Landsat is the fourth in a series of NASA spacecraft designed to continuously collect accurate information on Earth's resources. More than 100 nations will make use of the information gathered by Landsat 4 in land use planning, mineral exploration, and agriculture. Landsat project scientist Dr. Vincent Solomonson described a new instrument on the satellite called the thematic mapper. In urban planning, the thematic mapper will be very effective. Features that were blurred or hazy over cities as viewed by the, the multispectral scanner on Landsats 1 through 3 will be seen much more clearly from the thematic mapper. And as a result, urban planners will be able to manage and monitor the spread of the urban sprawl into the surrounding countryside. The major receiving and processing facility for Landsat data is located at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. After completing its three-year mission, Landsat 4 is designed to be retrieved by the space shuttle. Okay, standing by for up telemetry command reset. So what we have are 10 federal regions we have 10 federal regional councils, which are miniature Washingtons, in each federal capital. We're being regionalized, and pretty soon there won't be any such thing as this counties or states. So what we're doing is we're going from county and state control to total federal control, and then the federal government's losing its control to the United Nations. This is globalism. This leads to the federalization of our police or the security forces within the United States. And this is really in total violation of the constitutional implications, but they're not paying any attention to the Constitution. The internal security forces are not 
your peacekeeping, UN peacekeeping troops. Uh, peacekeeping troops are there to put down uh, actual revolutions and, and wars. The internal security forces are there more for crime control and the rounding up of people. Predominantly, the MJTF police will be the national police force. And this is George Bush and Clinton and the rest of them have continuously pushed this arms control treaty because they have to disarm us in order to make this thing work. If you will recall, we discussed that in the constitutional crisis. The MJTF police means multi-jurisdictional task force police and it removes all citizens from local, county, and state protections that you had under the law. And they're just abolishing all of this. And the MJTF police mission, we believe, is to, the house-to-house -house search and seizure of uh, people. It's made up of National Guard units, state and local police, convert street gangs as needed into uh, deputized police. House-to-house -house search and seizure, separa uh, separation and categorization of men, women, and children as prisoners in large, war, uh, large areas. Now, you have to understand that in order to liquidate the millions of people that Jesus Christ says are going to be liquidated, they have to plan this out long before it happens. 1965, they started the Office of Law Enforcement Assistance. Then came, in 1968, the Omnibus Crime Control Act which converted the OLEA to the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration. They called, in turn, in 1971 for a regionalized police force. In 1971, an advisory commission on intergovernmental relations issued a pamphlet called uh, M67, which called for a special multi-county and interstate police force. In other words, the merging of all police forces into one federal group. The LEAA in 1973 made calls for the elimination by merger of small police forces. This is exactly what Germany did under Hitler. All dictatorships have two common characteristics, general confiscation of guns in order to prevent internal rebellion and the establishment of a national police force to enforce the edicts of the dictator. We are following Nazi Germany almost to the exact letter. Uh, Carter issued an executive order 12148 and he established the Federal Emergency Management Agency known as FEMA. FEMA absorbed the LEAA and became the primary control organization for internal security of the United States in an emergency. And they're gearing this thing towards an emergency. That emergency is going to be World War III and it ushers in this whole system. They, they, FEMA has many interesting programs, Rex 82 Bravo, Rex 84 Alpha, Helix 2, Rex Alpha, Night Train, Cable Splicer, Garden Plot. These are all martial law training exercises. The plan is to bring America under martial law. We believe they know the American people would never accept this system except an external emergency were given. Uh, the UN system, remember, is a martial law military system. And the executive orders of FEMA, mandatory registration of all people, including babies and children in the United States, at the United States Post Office. They have boxes in them. We already know about it. Uh, they're marked for emergency use only. Uh, the primary one here to look at is 11,000, seizure of all civilians and work brigades, which is in reality slavery and includes the rights to split up families as well. In essence, what will happen in America is going to be worse than the communist revolution in Russia. This plan provides the basis for the deployment and employment of military resources, including National Guard personnel, for civilian disturbances. So Iron Mountain external threat number three has been and is now being implemented. An omnipotent police force. Next on the list is the space program as an economic substitute for war.
It is the development of a long-range sequence of space research projects with largely unattainable goals. It's the nearest modern equivalent yet devised to pyramid building and similar ritualistic enterprises of ancient societies. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Everything associated with the Saturn V was huge. The rocket itself, the building where it was assembled, and the crawler transporter that carried it to the launch pad. The fully loaded Apollo Saturn V was 363 feet tall. Its main engines alone generated 160 million horsepower, and its fuel pumps pushed fuel to the engines with the force of 30 diesel locomotives. As Saturn V lifted off Launch Complex 39 for the first time, it weighed more than 2,800 tons. Houston, you're go for landing, over. 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Straight shadow. Four forward. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30, down and a half. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Good. Hey. Contact light. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Across the country and around the world, the Apollo 11 crew were welcomed back as heroes. Before Project Apollo ended, six additional flights to the moon were made, and all but one were highly successful. Then ASTP. Apollo-Soyuz Test Project, a joint endeavor between the Soviet Union and the United States. 
The mission called for a mutual docking and crew exchange to develop the necessary equipment for international space rescues. We looked back at planet Earth with Landsat remote sensing satellites. Crops, forests, pollution, all can be photographed in great detail to help us better manage our Earth's resources. As of now, two-thirds of the planets in our solar system have been explored, and by the end of this decade, we will have explored most of the rest, including Uranus and Neptune. Space Shuttle 5, the first operational flight. Two commercial communications satellites were hauled into orbit, one for satellite business systems and one for Telesat of Canada. Their deployment was a complete success. Did you get it? You don't have it, obviously. I got it. Space Shuttle 6 was the second operational mission and Flight 1 for Challenger, this country's newest spacecraft. After launching a 5,000-pound tracking and data relay satellite from the payload bay, mission specialist astronauts Story Musgrave and Donald Peterson became the first Americans in nine years to walk in space, practice needed for satellite repair work. Historically, the space program has proceeded in a building block fashion. And toward that end, NASA has begun looking at the next logical step, a possible future space station, a permanent presence in space. The station would serve as a scientific and technological laboratory, as well as an operations base from which satellites could be serviced and large structures assembled. One of the highest priorities is to develop a clear understanding of a station's proper role in the total space program so that if and when it is proposed for development, the station will be a truly significant national asset, one that would ensure continued American preeminence in space. The space program in general, and the shuttle program in particular, have gone a long way to help our country recapture its spirit of vitality and confidence. The pioneer spirit still flourishes in America. In the future, as in the past, our freedom, independence, and national well-being will be tied to new achievements, new discoveries, and pushing back new frontiers. We must look aggressively to the future by demonstrating the potential of the shuttle and establishing a more permanent presence in space. Even when ratified, the INF Treaty will not totally eliminate the nuclear threat to Eurasia. The vast nuclear arsenal possessed by the USSR and the variety of delivery systems available still present a significant threat. The organization of fail-safe inspection machinery could well be ritualized in a manner similar to that of established military processes. Inspection teams might be very like armies and their technical equipment might be very like weapons inflating the inspection budget in other words what they want to do is they want to expand this so what do we have the INF treaty uh, where it says inspection machinery could well be ritualized according to Iron Mountain inspection teams might be very uh, like very armies and that's exactly what has happened we have a great ritual of disarmament. It's very interesting what you find when you start digging into the INF treaty hearings. Uh, limited test ban. Let's take a look at all the treaties. Limited test ban, 1963. Non-proliferation, 1968. The ABM treaty, 1972. The SALT 1, SALT 2, the IMF treaty. Very long drawn out process and this is exactly what Iron Mountain recommended be done. It is uh, one of the most important elements of the INF Treaty is the President establishes in this area operating on-site inspection. One layer of the regime it says on the last sentence builds upon another and it, the whole thing becomes elongated and it actually becomes a monster in and of itself.
The data exchanges required are really immense, and so it requires an elaborate governmental uh, system in order to accommodate all of this. And so Iron Mountain recommendation number two has definitely been implemented. The second one is the universal health care was a recommendation of Iron Mountain. Universal health care for all. It's an economic substitute for the war economy. It's very interesting how all of this works. Health, drastic expansion of medical research, education and training facilities, hospital and clinic construction, the general objective of complete government guaranteed health care for all. That's exactly what Clinton has introduced to the American people. He announced a universal health care and mandatory insurance program. And so they're putting everything in place exactly as Iron Mountain told them to do. It's universal and you cannot exempt yourself from it and it is causing a lot of trouble uh, around the nation. But the arguments are not going to be on that basis. What is going to happen is we're going to be issued eventually a global identification card and that is the purpose of this whole thing. The medical card has only one purpose, that's to get the foot in the door for the mark system. Iron Mountain's third recommendation is being implemented. Iron Mountain economic substitute number four, a new educational system to bring in globalism under the United Nations, UNESCO, Congressional Record, the Great Conspiracy to Destroy the United States, Education for Freedom and World Understanding. You see all of this is designed to bring us into a world system, a global system under the control of the United Nations. The second manifesto of the U.S. Office of Education, the implementation of the program of surrender through education. In other words, they destroy Americans' uh, national pride and put us under the United Nations. And the NEA uh, is leading in this. They even say it themselves, teaching about globalism and the world system. They say enduring peace cannot be attained until the nation states surrender to a world organization. This is found out during the Reese Committee hearings in Congress. Uh, putting the evidence together, we conclude the NEA has been an important element in the tax-exempt world to indoctrinate American youth with internationalism, which is synonymous with uh, a lot of uh, communist, uh, luminist, whatever you want to call it. The Iron Mountain agenda is being carried out. Outcome-based education, the developing of leaders for restructuring the schools, change agents, Parents are beginning to get upset, but they are not putting it together. American 2000, a national strategy, strategy to change every nation, every family. Uh, everything is going down exactly as Iron Mountain said it should. Uh, global education is nothing more than a promotion of the United Nations and to destroy the Constitution of the United States to bring us out from the Constitution and to merge us into the UN. That's what they're going to do. To improve learning and teaching by providing a national framework for educational reform. To promote research, consensus building, and systematic changes needed to ensure. You see, everything has to be changed. Guess what the changes all lead to? And guess who's behind it? If you look, Robert Mueller, former UN Secretary General to the UN, member of the Planetary Citizens, wrote the Global Core Curriculum, Marilyn Ferguson, the Aquarian Conspiracy, New Age. This is all being integrated into the educational system of America. And it's called America 2000. And it is extremely subversive. The national and international power play for education. It's going to go through because God has decreed it will go through. And UNESCO is behind it. 
Gorbachev, we parted with the old world, rejecting it once and for all. We are moving towards a new world, the world of communism. We shall never depart from it. Books are on the market explaining all of this. We don't have time in this video to get into it. But Iron Mountain Recommendation 4 is being implemented. Iron Mountain Sociological Substitute for War, Slavery. Another possible surrogate for the control of potential enemies of society is the reintroduction in some form consistent with modern technology and political processes of slavery for the control of potential enemies of a society. Anyone that does not agree with the new world order is an enemy of society and is therefore subject to slavery. Detention centers and concentration camps, work camps, are associated with forced labor, which is in reality slavery. Seizure under the executive orders of all civilians in work brigades, that's forced labor, that's slavery, which includes the rights to split up families. There are uh, concentration camps, detention centers, all over the United States set up under FEMA, under Rex 84, and there are presently, to the last count we had, 130 such facilities in the United States of America. In Arizona, you'll see, uh, for example, some there. Uh, we've got one here in Wisconsin. Concentration camps for U.S. citizens. Uh, the MJTF police to conduct house and house search and seizure and separation and categorization of men, women, and children and babies categorization and transfer to detention facilities and the running of detention facilities. Iron Mountain Slavery recommendation number two is, is mandatory service, a form of universal service turned to some variant form of the Peace Corps or the Job Corps. It is entirely possible that the development of a sophisticated form of slavery may be an absolute prerequisite for social control in a world of peace. Now this is just incredible when you really stop and look at what they're actually saying in relationship to biblical prophecies. Remember Jesus said they're going to round you up and kill you. President Clinton has authorized boot camps for young offenders. Is this the beginning of a larger scale for social reorientation like the communists do? Uh, America 2000, the national plan that's going into our schools requires mandatory community service. There are calls going out all the time. Bush and Clinton have called for mandatory community service for all youth up to say two years mandatory service you can serve in the service or some uh, other place but you are going to serve so the substitute for war is being implemented Iron Mountain sociological substitute for war number two is called blood games game theorists have suggested in other contexts the development of blood games for the effective control of individual aggressive impulses. More realistically, such a ritual might be socialized in the manner of the Spanish Inquisition and the less formal witch trials of other periods for the purposes of social purification, state security, or other rationale both acceptable and credible to post-war societies. Inquisitions, witch trials, for the purpose of social purification, state security, which is the key one, such a ritual might be socialized. In other words, they make it into a big social event like the Inquisitions were. We saw part of that beginning to unravel when we watched the Branch Davidian invasion and subsequent massacre of David Koresh and his group. A lot went down at Waco that very few Christians understand. David Koresh, the Branch Davidians, were demonized by the national media, first of all. They were tried, judged, and executed in a social ritual in total violation of every right guaranteed under state and federal constitutions. 
The Waco massacre followed all points of ritualized killing. They were a cult. It was for social purification, and therefore they deserved what they got. Their compound was raided by federal assault groups when in fact there was no evidence of any crime having been committed. Yesterday's action ended in a horrible human tragedy. Mr. Koresh's response to the demands for his surrender by federal agents was to destroy himself and murder the children who were his captives, as well as all the other people who were there who did not survive. He killed those he controlled, and he bears ultimate responsibility for the carnage that ensued. in the papers before I was going to go to court. Uh, they called me the white supremacist and all that. It's victims of demonization that we, that we all are victims of. When the federal government decides that it's going to prosecute somebody, they sort of demonize them.
began to ring out. Well, do you want to um, do you want to give your uh, federal agents that um, leeway to just say when they kill American citizens that things just they just went wrong. We just have a mother here dead. We have a little boy dead, and just things went wrong. During the Weaver trial, it was admitted by federal agents that they had been ordered to kill the Weavers regardless of any threat family members posed to government personnel. Now, I want you to think about how serious that is. What was the charge against Vicki Weaver? What crime against the state had she committed that warranted her execution by the federal government? Indeed, she was not charged with any crime whatsoever, yet the U.S. government ordered her shot on sight, a virtual uh, killing. It was murder in the first degree. It is cold-blooded, ritualistic, social purification because the Weavers held a viewpoint not politically correct. The Weaver case, along with the Branch Davidians, proves we are in the middle of the final battle for the Constitution of the United States. There are many, many enemies within America that want to get rid of our Constitution and destroy our rights. The war has now shifted from a paper and legal war to an overt shooting war, and we feel it's going to get far worse. Uh, they came against this thing to see what the reaction of the American people would be, and they found out that the American people cheered them on. So we are ready for a complete takeover. A spotlight put out a small publication on FEMA in, in case of emergency. Uh, an executive orders, Blueprint for Dictatorship, also is one of their publications. Now, an executive order is issued by the President of the United States. It does not go through the Senate or the Congress. He merely issues it. It's put in a federal register, and within 30 days, it has full effect of law, and nobody passes upon it. Now, that's fine, and he has some rights to do that, but not contrary to the Constitution of the United States. FEMA uh, developed national security emergency plans for the regulation of immigration, nationals of enemy countries, plans to implement laws for the control of persons entering or leaving the United States, uh, develop intergovernmental and interagency law enforcement plans and counterterrorism programs, to interdict and respond to terrorism incidents in the United States that may result in a national security emergency. To interdict and respond to terrorism incidents in the United States. Now this is a key that they're beginning to use. Under the new Crime Control Act, particularly under the Crime Control Bill Number 8, which is now before the Congress, a protester can be charged with terrorism. And this paves the way for the government to declare all those who oppose the New World Order as terrorists and therefore imprison them because you will be a political dissenter. To develop law enforcement plans to respond to civil disturbances. These people know perfectly well there's going to be major disturbance when this thing finally comes in. So they, they want all bases covered by law. So that's their rationale. It's, It'll, they will legally be able to do this. You don't think it's going to happen. This is exactly uh, the pre executive order issued by George Bush to quell the Los Angeles riots. L.A. went under martial law. 
Very few people understand what that means, but it means, in essence, that the Constitution in Los Angeles was totally suspended. And it says in there that units and members of the armed forces of the United States and federal law enforcement, uh, enforcement officers will be used to suppress the violence. In other words, it's, they're federalizing everything, and that's what happens under martial law, and to restore law and orders. They can also call up members of the National Guard. That's a key point. They're militarizing the nation. They're putting it under military law. If Americans do not want the new world order and they resist, America will go under immediate martial law rather than through the staged program into a martial law system, which is what the UN is. Also included to coordinate all federal agencies assisting in the suppression of violence and the administration of justice. Martial law suspends the Constitution of the United States. The UN is to be brought up to full power and it will rule through martial law via a three-tier military martial law system. The first one we're going to actually look at is called FinCEN and uh, FinCEN from the data we can get it's not only a financial uh, controlling sector but it has to do with uh, other things. Their equipment is black and there are reports of a multitude of black helicopters all over the United States. We get calls on it virtually every day from someone who's just had them flying over the house. The FAA says that the black paint schemes are used on helicopters by the Drug Enforcement Agency and the U.S. Army Special Operations. Here is a map of FinCEN locations in the United States, and these are confirmed, they claim. Uh, we have not been able to verify it. We're bringing this to you strictly unverified for troop deployment locations in the United States of America. Uh, there has been a, a fairly consistent reporting in Montana of UN combat uh, groups. Uh, they are in reality the top tier in the UN system and entrance to the US was by presidential executive order 
uh, 11 11 90 signed by President Bush and uh, there are many uh, battle group locations and there are many multi-jurisdictional task force police which are the thir third tier or the lowest on the UN police force and it is in reality from what we can gather is the federalization of the police forces in America and putting them in reality under the United Nations command uh, which we go under and that would be for the detention centers uh, concentration camps for dissenters are part of this overall system for the roundup of people. Now one of the largest ones is in Alaska. The Alaskan camp is the biggest being over one million acres and it's located just outside of Fairbanks according to reports and it's serviced by a spur line called the Alaskan Railroad. That's very interesting because under the emergency orders under FEMA one of the railroads that gets activated and falls under their control is the Alaskan Railway. And so we are beginning to find out that all of this uh, goes together. The Alaskan camp was purchased under a mental health bill and of course you have to understand that they are using mental health as one of their primary uh, methods of warfare. The Iron Mountain recommendations for an inquisition for social purification are also confirmed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Then sh shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. This is predominantly a move against Christians and Jesus Christ. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. See, that's exactly what they're doing right now. They're changing all the laws. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And in Revelation 17, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And this is actually, you're going to find out, has much to do with the United Nations. Iron Mountain substitute for war blood games has been in effect implemented and is being carried out. Ecological, considering the shortcomings of war as a mechanism of selective population control, it might appear that a devising substitutes for this function should be comparatively simple. In other words, war kills off some people and so now we have to have an ecological substitute for that function and it really boils down to total population control. Current trends in warfare, the increased strategic bombing of civilians and a greater military importance now attached to the destruction of sources of supply as opposed to purely military bases strongly suggests that a truly quanti qualitative improvement is in the making. In other words, as we phase down the war system there's probably going to be one great last one in their plans to really reduce the world population. There is no question but that a universal requirement that procreation be limited to the products of artificial insemination would provide a fully adequate substitute control for the population. A universal requirement that procreation be limited to products See how they treat people. Conception and embryonic growth taking place wholly under laboratory conditions would extend these controls to their logical conclusion. Now, total and complete control, this is what this means, of every human being born, they will be pre-selected genetically to be a slave to the rich men of the earth. This is the system they're setting up. They have an intermediate step, total control of conception with a variant of the pill via water supplies or certain essential foodstuffs. In other words, they intend to, when they bring in this new system, they will stop the growth of the population. They will put it into the food or the water supplies and then they would offset it by a controlled um, substance so that it could be counter Mandated and the woman become pregnant. And they claim in Iron Mountain that it was already under 
uh, investigation and under work back in 1961. So the interpretation is the mandatory mass sterilization of the human race with them in total control of all the antidotes for it. Excess population, Iron Mountain says, is war material. As long as any society must contemplate even a remote possibility of war, it must maintain a maximum supportable population. When the auditor finally gets his hands into the balance sheet, I suggest, therefore, that this be sold not through a democratic process. That would take too long and devour far too much of the funds to educate the cannon fodder, unfortunately, which populates the earth. We have to take almost an elitist program that we can see beyond our swollen bellies and look to the future in time frames and in results which are not easily understood or which can be, with intellectual honesty, be reduced down to some kind of simplistic definition.